Hello and welcome to the Inheritance Podcast. I'm Joe Riley. Today we are talking to Kristen Keffler, author of the book, The Myth of the Silver Spoon. Kristen is a consultant and founder of Illumination 360, a firm at the forefront of a global shift in family wealth advising known as Wealth 3.0. She guides affluent and enterprising families, rising gen, and the professionals who support them in embracing the positive power of wealth. She earned an undergraduate degree in human biology and chemistry with an emphasis on human peak performance. She also holds a Master of Science in Management from the University of Denver and a Master of Applied Positive Psychology from the University of Pennsylvania. In your book, you have this interesting concept of clutter that grows up around wealth I'd love to start with clutter and what it means to you, and then maybe we'll go through the four different kinds. Totally. What is this concept of clutter and then what is it doing in our lives? So the concept of clutter is that there there are these this psychological and emotional messiness that we have that and we have in all different places in our lives. And, and clutter, similar to common everyday clutter, I think if you think about what clutter is, in our lives. It's, it's the stuff that gathers in your closets and in the drawers. It's not the stuff that you have hanging out in the foyer or in your great room. You're not, it's the stuff we hide away and we jam into the corners. It's something that it lurks. It very often lurks beneath the surface. And I think everybody probably has an experience of deciding they were going to clean out the junk drawer or clean out their closet. And there's often, I think, a little resistance. Oh, I don't want to give up that shirt, or but I haven't worn it in three years and it doesn't fit. But then once you actually make the decision, like, you know what, I'm just going to create some space in here. It feels really good. And I think this, the kind of clutter I'm talking about is psychological and emotional clutter, but it, it acts the same way, where it's the stuff that it's our beliefs, it's the shoulds and the have tos and all the ways that we are getting messages really from a very early age about who we are, who we're allowed to be, the role that money plays in that. There's just a lot of messaging that we get. And then that can be the start of how we identify. And that could be really empowering. But oftentimes there's a fair bit of messiness in that. And money really just creates such a magnifying glass on all of that. So ultimately, uh, the bit on the big concept of clutter is that is that it mimics our daily clutter. It's just internal. And the four key areas that I see really often, particularly with Rising Gen, is that one, there's this sense of money clutter. And that can money and then by extension, this really abstract concept of wealth, which is even more difficult to wrap your head around than what's my relationship with wealth versus what's my relationship with money. Wealth is very abstract. Money, at least you can pay for coffee with and buy a sweater and understand some tangibility with it. But it, but having that relationship doesn't have money really in its right place as a tool for whatever it's supposed to be used for. Instead, there's a lot of power dynamics in that. And I think that often relates to the second form of clutter, which is identity clutter. Jim Grubman and Dennis Jaffe write about this in their seminal article, Acquirers and Inheritors, which you did a revisit with them not so long ago. That, And I think it's such an incredible article. And they talk about this continuum of over-identifying and under-identifying with wealth. And I think that so often a rising gen is on one side of the continuum or the other or seesawing back and forth, depending on the circumstance. And that that as a result, instead of having this clear sense of who they are separate from wealth and from a significant family name, that instead they can be in one place or the other, seesaw back and forth and feel like they're over-identifying with it and not having an identity of their own or under-identifying and running from like trying to create separation. But that also doesn't heal whatever needs to be healed for integrating a family story into one's identity. Then the third piece of clutter that I see so often is relationship clutter. And you and I got to talk about this a couple of years ago when we were talking about the second fiscal and equals article, has how we were revisiting that concept that originally Jay and Jackie and Joni had written about 20 years ago now. And and I think relationship clutter in the context of relationships are just messy, right? It's humans. We like no relationship is without its stuff. That's just part of what we're here to do is work together to figure out how to be in a relationship and be who we are and still be with someone else. And I think that money can create clutter where that it can become more difficult to really recognize how much does somebody love me for me and how much do they love me for 
the stability I provide or the security I provide. And trying to really be discerning with that can be very difficult. And then you add on some of the many processes and structures that we have in the estate planning world. And you and Covey talked about this on a recent call. And I think her new book is brilliant as it really looks at the value of the prenup and how much is it valuable? How much is that something that supports or how much does it not support a new couple? So I think relationship clutter is another one that money can really exacerbate. And then finally, this idea of contribution, which I named contribution rather than work because I think work has a very clear connotation of something that's paid. And I don't think you have to get paid to feel like you're providing meaningful contribution. But most people, that is the exchange that most of us feel, but it's it doesn't have to be for a rising gen. And the thing that where there's, I think, the opportunity for the most clutter there is this idea that that removing the financial need to work, we forget doesn't remove the human need to work. That as beings, as human beings, we're wired for contribution. We're wired to have this sense that when we do something, when we show up with our skills and our brains and our hearts, that we have impact and that impact has is like a virtuous cycle that reflects back to us that we matter. That's a piece that gets very confused and is missing when there's suddenly not a financial need to work. That's out. Oh, I don't have to work. Work is hard. I have to get up every day. I have to go do something. And that doesn't doesn't tend to the real need for work. Like what what is the value of work in our lives? What do you think clutter comes from? Is this is it just anxiety? Is it fear? Is it just the mess that you don't have time for in life? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I think that across the economic continuum, humans accumulate emotional and psychological clutter. And that probably is is a part of the human condition, that part of our psychological journey is to learn how to have agency in our lives, to be choiceful about what we want to do, release old beliefs that don't serve us and choose ones that do serve us. That's probably just part of our human journey. I think that in this particular context where we're talking about high net worth families and significant families with really prominent names, we don't have a very healthy relationship with money and with power. And so because we are not really able to have open, honest conversations about how we feel about money, we, we spend a lot of time talking about it, but it, but not really, we don't even slow down enough to pinpoint, like, I don't feel good when this situation happens, or we can point to some of the classic stories that I hear from Rising Gen where they know that their parents love them. There's a felt sense that I absolutely believe my parents love me. But more often than when push came to shove, I felt like they showed that love through gifts rather than time. And I have a story from one of my Rising Gen, and it was actually her mom that told me this story, which I thought was interesting that this mom was a super powerhouse CEO, and the dad also worked in the same company that they co-created this company that was a super significant company. They had a single daughter and who was mostly raised by the nanny, same nanny all through her childhood. And the mom was telling me a story at one point where, and she was just laughing about it, the circumstance. She said they were on a hayride and something started to happen where the, the cart that they were in started to tip and that the daughter's, she's 10, and her first instinct was to go protect her nanny, not mom, right? She went to go grab to make sure the nanny didn't fall off the cart. And her mom just laughed. She was like, yeah, she was around more, right? And it's, I know that client felt the love of her mother, but she didn't. She she also felt what my mom was pursuing was more important. So she made sure I had, I was taken care of. I went to private school, I had a nanny, all that kind of stuff, but she didn't show up for me. And I think that those are the kinds of things that form clutter that we just, but we don't have a very healthy way of even talking about that. So it comes from confusing messages. I think so. Yeah, conflicting messages that on all sorts of fronts, conflicting messages about work. Like how many times do you have growing up? I didn't get this clear sense like work is awesome. Go do like great work in the world. It was like, how soon can we get to Friday? Oh, there's confusing messages about work. There's confusing messages about relationships. We have this false sense that things should always be harmonious. And if they're not, then maybe something's wrong rather than we should learn to be adaptable and have really honest conversations that are sometimes difficult. Yeah. So I think it is. I think there's confusing messages in all four of, the, of those realms of clutter that I just named. And that is part of our job in adulting is learning and deciding what am I going to hold on to and what am I going to let go so I can move forward? And I know it's not covered in the book, but do you think there are larger issues in the society that we don't have those messages or is that a feature? I think the fact that we don't 
that we don't engage in those kinds of conversations are actually a problem. I feel like it is a little bit controversial to say, but I do think that it's true that bashing someone who is wealthy, particularly someone who has inherited wealth, simply for the fact of what they have inherited is still one of the few socially, it's still socially acceptable, where we wouldn't allow that in many of pretty much any other trait I can think of that we most of us wouldn't tolerate somebody bashing someone for just for who they are. And but we collectively still think it's okay to make fun of, to wish ill on people, particularly people who have inherited money that we see as not even just culturally, but I, I think that by and large, see as ill-gotten, not ill-gotten, like not uh, not appropriate, not earned. I think you did say something about in the book about inheritors are discounted in society, and that's acceptable. And I'm that's glad probably I said the it. biggest. It's probably the biggest. Yes, it's probably <laughs> the biggest at the heart of all of these clutters. So let's just take them one by one briefly, is because they're so interesting. The money clutter. How do you? How does one figure out their relationship to money? Yeah, I think it again. So there's like both the inner elements of this and the outer elements. And I think that with money, there's the inner elements that drive clutter are the things that are limiting beliefs around wealth, the money stories we've inherited, which can be everything from I deserve this. We, our family deserves this to, to the other end of the continuum, which is this could all go away tomorrow. And kids are absorbing these messages all the time by how their parents act around money and the and what they say out loud around it the inner landscape of how we feel about money comes from both really society society's message which i think a lot of times inheritors internalize the message of the confusion that society holds around both having envy for wealth and also disdain for the people who hold it at the same time and i think inheritors internalize that and a lot of that creates this clutter that ultimately ends up resulting in the core message I often hear is no one wants to hear the problems of a rich kid. I can't find my way out of a paper bag. Who can I talk to about why I'm struggling so much when I'm living at my parents' beach house and I don't have a job? And right, there's all these things that are like, wow, I have it so easy. Why am I struggling? And there's a lot that is actually beneath the surface that creates that clutter. So to really move to a healthier relationship to it, we have to slow down the dialogue. And this really pertains to all the sources of clutter that I identify in the book. But you got to slow down the inner dialogue to recognize how and when am I getting hooked into something that takes me on a path that's not actually where I want to go And I, when I think about money. That inner work around what are my beliefs around money often or invariably drive outer behaviors. And those behaviors can be things like not ever having kept a budget or even understanding cash flow or understanding debt and credit scores and basics of personal finance, let alone the complexity of what happens when you have wealth and estate structures and all this sort of 2.0 and 3.0 stuff. And so for a lot of times, I, I think for rising gen and for parents and trusted advisors who are engaged and really supporting them, there needs to be this recognition that you can't just go build the skill and think that inner stuff is cleaned up and ready to integrate that skill, that both things have to happen. There has to be some room to and some space to be able to create a healthier inner relationship with money and with wealth and with a prominent family name. And then there also has to be related skills that help you anchor that and be an adult and take on responsibility. And that that process really does flow to each of the other kinds of clutter where it's like there's a need for each one of us to take responsibility and say, I need to clean up this inner stuff. And then I need to figure out how I'm going to show up in the world in a way that's reflective of who I want to become, not who I have been. That leads into the identity clutter. And one of the things you said was it's an issue if people over-identify with the wealth and also if they under-identify with the wealth. Yeah. As you think about like Dr. Meg J was probably one of the sort of more contemporary people to really write about identity, identity formation, particularly in one's 20s and in her book, The Defining Decade. And she refers to a lot of other great identity researchers. But one of the things that I really appreciate about her work and her spotlighting the 20s in particular as a really important time is that identity formation happens throughout the, throughout our lives. Like Eric Erickson was the psychologist who really identified kind of the stages of identity development. But the 20s are particularly powerful because 
they are a time when there's, it's really appropriate to break away from family, to find out who you are separate and to push against everything that you've been told growing up and to figure out well, how much of that do I believe is true? How much do I integrate into who I am? And the thing that I think is particularly complex in wealthy families is that in this really important time when it's really appropriate for 20-somethings to be really building their own identity capital, to building experiences, to understanding who they are separate from their family, that that it's also a time when often the family is like either there's common structures that keep everybody tied together. And so you, it's harder to go find your own path. Or it's a time when maybe people are starting to young rising gen are starting to get resources that can become a buffer against the work of identity formation. Some of what identity formation is about is like going out and just getting a job job. I'm like, all right, I got to like now I'm working at the coffee shop right now while I'm getting a master's degree. And how do I balance those things? And so I think that ultimately what can become confusing is the over identification in a time when just finding one singular identity is super important. Wealth can be a confusing factor and it can be easy or seductive to over identify with it and just say, I am from a wealthy family. This is our standing in the community. I'm not going to fight it. And then there's a sense of importance because of the wealth rather than because of your individual sense of self. And I think that we all know examples of the other side of the continuum where there have been rising gen who like flee to the far side of the country to just try to get away from, from their family name and the and not because they're ashamed of their family, but because they're so desperate to try to find their own identity, but don't know how to do that in the space of being with their family, which is actually, I think, not a terrible move. But when it becomes unhealthy as if you can't, or quote unquote, come home, right? And then find the place to integrate your family story into who you are and be proud of and connected to that while also being an individual and understanding what role you want wealth to play in your own life. Do you think a certain amount of rebellion is inevitable? Yep, I do. I think it's, I think it's important. It's part of, as parents, we, it's uncomfortable, right? You don't, nobody likes it when their teenagers start pushing against them and it's like, wait a minute, who are you? But there's also, that's an important part of finding your own voice is having some rebellion. The way to create a less explosive rebellion is to, create the space where it's toler not only tolerated, but maybe invited. So yeah, you, sh you should be like, you should have your own opinion on this and we should make room for that. I want to hear what you have to say. So yeah, I, I think it's actually really good, even though it's uncomfortable and family systems don't tend to tolerate rebellion. Then we have relationship clutter. Folks have a lot of insecurity and shame around wealth. So how do you build high quality connections? Yeah, I've really thought a lot about this and looked at the relationship science and what it says about building high quality connections and what can get in the way of that. And I do think this one is in some ways so easy and in some ways so hard. And what I mean by that is I think that when children are parented in a way that they feel a genuine sense of feeling seen and they know what it feels like to be able to be off their authentic selves in a family system, it gives them a better leg up to know what authentic and the near enemy of authentic relationships are. But when there's not that feeling of what it really feels like to be seen and appreciated for who you are in a family relationship, I think it gets even more complex when now you're dating or it's friends. And especially in that super confusing time of early adolescence into teenagehood, when it's already just trying to figure out who's in the in-group and the out-group and where do I fit in the in-group and the out-group and and there's already peer stuff is so play so predominantly. And if you add the layer on of then questioning, do I just have the coolest house to hang out at or do these people all really like me? It, and but not being able to really discern that difference, it can set up some very messy early adulthood and adult relationships where there's not a clear sense of feeling appreciated for who you are rather than what you have or what you bring to the relationship from a financial standpoint. They're some of the most important work, like having that home base. In my research, when I was talking to Rising Gen and they would talk about the importance of at least having that one person. Sometimes for some of them, they didn't meet that person until they actually met their spouse. For some, it was like, oh yeah, I had that one girlfriend from fourth grade that like 
like knew where the bodies were buried. Like we were so deep and tight and it didn't matter what my family history was or what hers was. We're just friends and I knew it. And that is an important reference point, but a lot of rising gen don't have it. And then there's contribution clutter, which is how does one find their work in life, purpose in life, where do they make an impact? That might be a good jumping off point to how do you start clearing up this clutter? Because that's a big part of that. Yeah. So the ocean clutter is, again, it's like I, like at the core of it, I think, is the confusion of the financial need to work versus the human need to work. And once we understand that removing the financial need doesn't remove the human need, then we can actually start to have a productive exploration of what does it mean for me to contribute then? And does that? In the book, I talk about frameworks for impact work. There's some great models for some really interesting things that some rising gen are doing around taking family resources and being very socially entrepreneurial in models for contribution that are actually really viable businesses. There's also impact giving and really exploring what it, this is very much the Sharna, Goldsecker, Michael Moody sweet spot with Generation Impact. What are the models and out, that are out there? What rising gen are doing really big things? And how can you think about Using the privilege they've been given and privilege in in the most uplifted way, like opportunities that that they have that other people don't have because of the families they've been born into and the social capital that they have and that kind of thing. How might you use those to create change that really is feels meaningful? And I say in the book, and I feel very strongly that clearing this clutter on the individual level and living a life of meaning and thriving just in your own individual self and family is enough. Well-being is an autotelic goal and should be across the entire economic spectrum. And I think that those who have been born into the higher side of the economic spectrum, if they so choose, there is an additional invitation that they can lean into that is around contribution on a bigger scale just because they generally have access to financial resources and social resources that Others may not. But I do think it's important to say that not everybody who's born into a situation with wealth needs to be like they have to go out and change the world on a big scale. Like sometimes it's enough to tend to your home fires in a way that you're raising good kids and being a good community member. It might be a good time to ask you about the academic influences on your work and how has positive psychology influenced you, the work of Seligman, Chick Sent Me High. Yeah, I feel that's a It's a question I love to answer. I feel like, so positive psychology, I have felt called to really since the field was first becoming something organized, which wasn't until the late 1990s, and not that there weren't many roots of positive psychology coming through the humanist movement, and like positive psychology has had deep roots way back to the early Greek philosophers, so it's not like it was born in 1998. It was really formalized when Marty Seligman made his call to the American Psychological Association and said, we should spend as much time focusing on human thriving as we have historically spent understanding human suffering. I think I stumbled upon positive psychology probably around 2000. And I just, I was so attracted to this idea of there being frameworks for thinking about human thriving and research that looked at human thriving. And and the more that I was on the fringes learning about it and reading the books that Seligman would publish or eventually Angela Duckworth and Grid and Barb Fredrickson and her work with positive emotions, always reading from the sidelines and thinking, gosh, like how cool. And I felt really called to go and formalize that work through the program at Penn. And I'm so glad I did. It was one of those things that I first applied to that program 10 years before I actually finished the application and did something about it. And I just, it was like, I think it was like the third year of the MAP program. I applied and then I was like, I don't know. I just also started my consulting business. I don't know how I'm going to do all of this and get to Philadelphia and pay for this and make it all happen. And so I stopped, but then I was in a conversation with my husband over dinner, then 10 years later, and I was like, we have a four-year-old. I don't like, this seems crazy, but I, every time I look at that curriculum, I just, I want to go bury myself in it. And he was like, why, there's not going to be a better time. Why was it so compelling? I don't know if it's just me that feels so, but I don't think it's just me. I think that as humans, there's a part of us that recognizes the possibility of strength. Like we, it's it's also a very wealth 3.0 kind of concept where it's like, what if we looked more at 
where we are good and strong and capable, it doesn't mean that we're not tending to difficult emotions and that we're not tending to conflict, but doing it from a place of strength rather than a place of weakness or fear. How much more capable are we of creating pathways forward that actually are sustainable? And I feel like for me, the personal journey has just affirmed for me that it's the highest qualities of human excellence are worth pursuing and that it's not only more joyful. And I feel like I work harder, but with more joyful vigor when I'm coming from a place of strength, the strength of having cleared money clutter and saying it is more important to me to have impact than to turn the knob on every financial opportunity I can. Sometimes that's more important to really think about the ripple of this work rather than monetizing every opportunity. And to me, that feels like more coming from a place of strength than a place of scarcity. Make a distinction between the science of human thriving versus what is often called happiness studies. I think that it's important. It speaks a little bit to what I just was saying that I think one of the bad raps that positive psychology gets, and maybe if Marty Seligman and, and friends had come up with a name that didn't have positive in it, it, we would have a more holistic understanding of collectively, we'd have a holistic understanding of what this actually means. But I think one of the bad raps is that people really think it's happyology, right? It's okay, we'll just put a smiley face on everything and what that'll make me happier. And when in fact, like, Positive psychology is really about embracing the full gamut of the human experience. And it, it and in that, it's about really understanding that human thriving is a result of conscious intention, conscious action, conscious pursuit. And that in doing so, that the science of human thriving would be very limited if all we focused on was happiness. And that happiness, I and I think the Greek philosophers would say it's valuable. But it's a thin, the, sort of a thin goal. The idea of hedonic pleasure versus eudaimonic pleasure, like both are valuable. Hedonic is more about the pursuit of, of pleasure and happiness. And eudaimonic is more about the pursuit of meaning. And I think both are valuable. But if you only ever, if you only ever pursued hedonic pleasure, you probably, you would be on that hedonic treadmill. And it, at some point you'd just keep finding it's not enough. It's not enough. Do you sometimes have doubts about your work with the wealthy? I have. I do. I There have been times, and I write about this in the book, that there's a particular s story of from last year, actually. I was I had just gotten the book contract. I was writing the book while I was on the plane going down to this meeting for a family. And while I was there, I was working on it. And in between working with the family, I would be out and about running in this little beach community and stuff like that. And or out to dinner. And there was a number of times that I was struck, and this isn't the only time I've been struck this way, but I was struck by the insular nature of being in this private beach club where everybody there is white and wealthy. And it's very, it appeared from what I could observe, very homogenous and sometimes very wasteful and like environmentally wasteful, like the number of like to-go cups that were just being thrown away and things where I was like, wow, this all, it both feels so disconnected from this beautiful beach and all of these wonderful reefs we're trying to also protect. And I don't blame that just on on wealth or the wealthy, but I think that wealth can create a buffering effect that that if we choose to not be aware of our impact, we can live that way. Wealth can create the buffer that you not have to feel those rough edges of the consequences of your actions. And I will say that when I have had those moments where I'm like, am I pooling myself and thinking that my contribution and having chosen to work in this field, could I, should I be using my skills somewhere else? But every time I do, I reconnect with the families that I work with who are good hearted, committed, engaged and awake and alive. And the rising gen are just incredible human beings. And then I think there is power to privately held capital and the only way that it can really be deployed with great success into the world is when the individuals and families and family systems are healthy enough to translate wealth and money to a, the tool that it is, rather than holding on for more and more security. There's a great story in the book that really jumped out and I thought about for a few days. It's Liz really wanted to start a yoga studio and put in a lot of time and effort into it. Then her parents invited her along on a multi-month sailing trip. So she took the trip and didn't start the studio. Now, yeah. what advice would you give to Liz? 
Man. So Liz is a real client. And while the details of that story are not exactly the details, they like they're pretty close. So my advice to Liz at the time was to be really thoughtful about what project forward six months, like what is going to feel more like her her big thing was in large part identity, this interconnection with her parents who she loved, who loved her, but then her inability to launch out into the world and go throw a stake in the ground and and really say, this is what I want in this case to start a yoga studio. And, and my advice to her was to really think about which choice was going to fuel the long-term reward or the long-term outcome that she was seeking. And she did ultimately choose to go on the sailing trip. And it ultimately just delayed her ability to get traction in her life for what turned out to be years. And this is one where recognizing the power of the family system is also really important because in this case, it took her having, I never actually worked with her parents, but it took me having conversations with her about being able to communicate to her parents that she needed, she loved doing these things with them and she needed to start creating her own life and to actually have those conversations with her mom, particularly to say, I need to get traction. And in order to get traction, I have to be home long enough to have a job and to, or to make something a go. I can't like go off and travel as much as it's fun and to really get her mom's buy-in on that. And in this case, it worked. And I think that's it, it really speaks to the power of the pull of family dynamics, which we can't dismiss as we have conversations about individuals. Family dynamics are powerful. There's a story there in the book. I think it was Trent and Danny. I was interested in where you fall on prenups. Yeah. I'll say that prior to reading Cubby's book that's yet to be released in February, I felt in many ways maybe they're a necessary, I'll say necessary evil, but they're like, okay, if you got to have them, like, how can we do this better? And I, after coming out of my positive psychology master's and really looking at the relationship science and thinking about the prenup as in a structure, I was like, there's got to be a way to do this differently. And I, I spent some time tooling up a process for how could I put the couple at the center and help them at least feel like they are on even footing with themselves, with each other, understood their values and what drove their money decisions, and then help them each get educated about what to expect you know, why two attorneys? Why is there a drafting attorney and a responding attorney? And who pays for it? And what are the terms? What are common terms? What do they mean? So that they could actually create some parity first. And I would say like in Trent, in the story of Trent and Danny, it, they were, I haven't had it go badly yet. I feel like every couple who is engaged in it has said, okay, we tolerated this necessary evil. After having read Covey's book and thinking about really like how much is truly at risk and every family is different because their estate structures are different. But if we really put the couple at the center and reconsidered the prenuptial process, like how often would it, how often would it really make sense? So I think that I think Cubby has changed my tune and make, made me want to be a little bit more of a, yeah, plant my flag where hers is planted. Very interesting. The name of the book is The Myth of The Silver Spoon. The author is Kristen Keffler. Thank you so much for joining us, Kristen. Thank you, Joe. This was delightful. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We appreciate it.